Hello, my name is Christy Hodson, and I'm pastor at the Stoneham Memorial Seventh-day Adventist Church, located at 29 Maple Street. For over 100 years, our church has been serving the communities in and around Stoneham, Massachusetts. We currently have a clothing distribution and food bank for Stoneham residents that's located at 9 Gary Street. We also operate Greater Boston Academy, an elementary and preschool located at 108 Pond Street. We thank you for joining us here today at our weekly church service. Hello. Happy Sabbath. We are here once again, and uh, I want to wish you a happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Uh, I was doing a little bit of research, and uh, um, I found that... Uh, uh, Father's Day was established like a, like a ho regular holiday 58 years after Mother's Day. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> yes, one of the things about uh, Father's Day is that you're never late. Uh, you don't, um, for Mother's Day, if you wait until the last moment to find a car that you go to the store, all the shelves are empty. Father's Day, there are still some, <laughs> plenty. Yes, but, uh, uh, but we're happy for all of you. We're happy that, uh, that we're back here after uh, how many days? Several days, months. But God has been good to us, right? Yes, and uh, um, we want to remind you that, um, that today we have... A drive through from two to four. They told me to tell you that you need to come through that entrance and exit through that one. Yeah, I think that one is Maple and you exit through Chestnut. Is that right? Okay, I got it. Also, as a reminder, we're asking you that you maintain your social distancing six feet and, uh, uh, and you have to have one of those I'm trying to have this one, but I need a third ear to have my microphone in this one. So I'm trying to, you know, comply with this. And also, uh, those of you who, who want to give your tithes and offerings, uh, there is uh, there's going to be uh, there's a box here on the wall as, as you exit through this door. And we're encouraging you to do online giving or mailing uh, your tithes and offerings. Uh, and be sure to look around that um, you don't leave anything here. Um, so when, when we finish, uh, the, um, we're going to exit uh, by the, the first one here, and we're going to exit through here and make sure that you take all your belongings with you. Um, and I think that's all the announcement that I have for today. Um, if, if I remember something, I will tell you later. But have a happy Sabbath. Hi, everyone. Our story for today is about the man who was sent by God to save his enemies. Welcome to Joey's Bible Puppet Show. Jonah was a prophet of God. The Lord said to Jonah, Go to the city of Nineveh and tell them that I will punish them for their wicked ways. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. The Assyrians were very cruel to the Israelites. They were invading the kingdom of Israel, Jonah's people. So instead of going to Nineveh, Jonah headed to Tarshish. He found a boat going to Tarshish, very far away from Nineveh. While they were in the sea, a big storm came. The waves blew and the waves rose. The boat was about to break. The sailors were so scared. And they said to Jonah, pray to your God to save us from the storm. Jonah said, I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. 
throw me into the sea. I have disobeyed God's command, and it is because of me that you were in this big storm. The sailors didn't want to throw Jonah into the sea, but the storm became stronger and stronger. Throw me down into the sea so you can be safe. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea. Storm stopped and the sea was calm. God sent a huge fish to swallow Jonah up. Gobble, gobble, gobble. For three long days and three long nights, he was inside the big fish. While inside the stomach, he prayed to God. He said, Lord, you threw me into the deep waters and the waves swept over me. But you have kept me alive. And you heard my prayer. I promise to obey your command. You and you alone can save me and everybody in this world. So God commanded the big fish to bring Jonah to dry land. God said to Jonah, Go to the city of Nineveh and tell them the message I have told you. So Jonah went to the big city of Nineveh and told the people, Because of your wicked ways, God will punish you after 40 days. The Ninevites believed and repented. They stopped doing bad things. God saw their actions and he did not punish them. Sometimes God will ask us to reach out to people who have hurt us. Most of the time we won't want to do it. We'd rather run and hide. Alone it's impossible to do. So let God's love swallow you whole. Let him change you, that you may help change others. God calls us to love even our enemies, because Jesus loves everybody. Yay! What story would you like us to do next? Put it in the comments below. See you next time. Now that I'm at triple and quadruple distance from everybody. <laughs> it, technology is wonderful when it works. When it doesn't, err. All right, our scripture reading for today is found in Acts chapter 7, verses 54 to 60, and it's about Stephen the martyr. <clears throat> Acts chapter 7, verses 54 to 60. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. That is, he died. Quite the reading of Stephen the martyr and how a bright shining life came to a scary end. But the Lord was with him and he'll have a special martyr's place in heaven. We're going to pray now and uh, in just moments I'll invite you to kneel, but are there prayer requests? Sometimes I get handed a list. Amen. All right. Well, thank you for that. If your knees and ankles permit it, I'd invite you to kneel, and I'll be here for the prayer.
Our Father God in heaven, we're just grateful that we can be together. I'm thankful that you've protected us with health and strength. There have been some of our members who were sick, but they've recovered. We're grateful for that. And yet at the same time, we per perhaps know of friends or someone, friend of a friend, who had this illness and perhaps succumbed to it or was very ill and suffering the sequelae, the troubles stemming from it. And so, Lord, we're just praying that you will be with the families of those who've lost loved ones, for those who, are, who have survived but have injuries from it. Lord, I'm just praying that you will strengthen their bodies. Lord, we want to cooperate with you in life, doing everything we can for our health. And I just praise the Lord for all those who are here today. I ask that you'll be with Pastor Freddie as he speaks with us, that his words to us from your word will strengthen and encourage our hearts, give us wisdom to be like you. Thank you that you forgive our sins. You're faithful and just to forgive us our sins when we confess them to you, and then you cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For your many blessings, we thank you, and I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. On this warm, summery day, I think of a story where Jesus was very thirsty. And he asked a woman for a drink, which she provided. And then he tells her, everyone who drinks of the water of this well will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water which I give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This morning, Rad and I will offer a prayer and music, a refreshing prayer, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
Thank you. For a moment, I thought I was not here, but I was in the presence of God in the throne of heaven. I'm looking forward to that day where we will be with, with the angels and we will worship Jesus because of his grace that found us when we were not looking for. But it also has the power to seal us for the courts above. What a wonderful reminder about the, the grace, about the love of Jesus. God's non-intervention. That's how I entitled my sermon this morning. Because uh, the first book that I learned how to read was the Bible. We didn't have a lot of books back home, so I got a, my parents got me a good news Bible that has pictures. So I got excited about reading uh, those action stories of King David, of Goliath, and, uh, uh, and, we, and I believe that a lot of times, at least that have been my experience, we expect God to intervene in, in our lives when we're going through difficult situations. We expect that God is going to answer in a certain way. And then, you know, I know all of us are familiar with these stories, that the story of, of Daniel. I mean, he's in the lion's den, and, uh, and God sent his angels, and, and, and he delivers Daniel from the lion's den. We have his, his three friends and the furnace of fire, and again, God intervenes. He's with them. And, and we see all these stories in the Bible, And then we expect something to happen when it comes to John the Baptist. We see that he's in prison and, and then he, he's killed. And, and I struggle with this because I was trying to figure out why God didn't do anything for him. But then I learned that when John the Baptist was in prison, that God would sell his angels to minister to him. And that John found courage knowing that throughout history, when people think about suffering and going through trials in life, they will think about him. And then we find this story in Acts chapter 6. We started with this story last week with, uh, with the seven deacons. And, uh, uh, and I, won't, I won't make you to memorize the names of the seven deacons. But there are two that the book of Acts spends some time in them. One is a Stephen. And the Bible describes a Stephen as a full of the Holy Spirit, wisdom, full of grace. And remember that he is given a ministry, and his ministry is that he, he is to make sure that the Greek widows receive the same, same treatment as the Jewish widows. But as we talked about last week, when God gives you a ministry, He's going to give you more opportunities to witness for him. And I'm sure that all of us have those experiences in life. That you are doing something, and all of a sudden, that thing that you are doing opens an opportunity to do something else. So I believe that this is what happened with Stephen. He was serving people food, but then he found 
that people needed more than food, and I started sharing the message of Jesus with them. Let me tell you something that I have learned. That sharing the message of Jesus can also cause you a lot of problems. And I'm sure that some of you have seen that because the reality of the gospel and the reality of the Bible is that sometimes uh, the Bible and the message of Jesus bring peace. That, that's what God wants. God wants every human being to have peace, to have their experience with him. But Jesus also says that also is a sore that cuts, that divides. And, and I've seen it when, when someone decides to follow Jesus. A lot of times, those people who oppose them or oppose her are the people that are closer to him. I remember someone who joined the church some time ago, and, uh, and she was telling me, Pastor, uh, we didn't have any problems in our house. We used to go to parties, drink, and all this kind of stuff. But then when I decided to join the church, things started to happen at home. We see that. Jesus wants to bring peace, but also the word cuts. It's like a sore. So when you share Jesus, you're going to bring peace to people, but it also going to bring opposition. And then, persecution. Because the Bible is clear that all those who, who want to live godly lives will suffer persecution. And that sounds really strange for us in the 21st century. But reading the book of Acts, things help us to understand that circumstances could change rapidly. So we hear that they, they bring a Stephen. He is what we call a martyr. He's the first martyr during the time after Jesus Christ. That word martyr in the Greek language is the same word that it is used for witness. So there is a connection between being a martyr and being a witness. That means that when you witness for Christ, you're witnessing for Christ with your life and that you're willing to die for what you believe. And this is what I see in the story here of Stephen. But one thing I know, that if you learn to live for Christ, you also will learn to die for Christ. And that's what I see. So we have this Sanhedrin people, and the Sanhedrin was was a powerful council. It was composed, some historian says, for about 70 people. And, and the person who was the chair, the person who was in charge of that committee was the high priest. They had a lot of authority. But it's interesting that in this Sanhedrin, they were people with different theological views. Some of the members of the Sanhedrin were Sadducees. You heard of those in the Gospels. And some of the other were the Pharisees. They were opposite. The Sadducees were the liberals. They were looking, what's in it for me? How can I take advantage of, their, of this position? Even how do I earn the favor with the Romans so I can keep my position. The Pharisees were the separate, very strict in their religious beliefs. But they come together, and we see them in the gospel stories, they come together for the trial of Jesus, and they come together here also for the trial of Stephen. I find that interesting 
that enemies become friends. You read that in the, in the gospel stories when Herod and Pilate were enemies, but the Bible says that they became friends for the trial of Jesus. You know how they say, uh, what, what is the, the proverb? An enemy of my enemy is what? Is my friend, right? Is that what it says? A friend of my enemy. <laughs> I mean, an enemy of my enemy is my friend. So it's something like that that happens here. You see uh, liberal conservatives come together in the trial of Jesus. I wonder if God is trying to tell us something. Because a lot of time we define ourselves partisans. I belong to this political party and you belong to that political party. In fact, someone did a, a research recently and found that Seventh-day Adventists are divided between party lines. Uh, you wanna guess? 35% say that they were Republicans. 45% said that they were Democrats and, uh, and 35% said that they were either independent, independent or really didn't care. So we're divided, but remember, groups come together. So a lot of times we think, okay, this political party goes with my beliefs, or this political party goes with my belief, and, a lot, and sometimes we're trying to picture Jesus as being either or, but I believe that Jesus is neither of that party or the other party, but the party that Jesus has is, is the cross. And as Christians, I believe that that should be where we should align with the cross of Christ. And, and Jesus says that uh, the unity of, of his church is not gonna come through political parties, but Jesus says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So we need to align ourselves with the word of God and with Jesus Christ. But let's go back to the story of Stephen before I get in trouble here. We read that Stephen served tables, but he also explained the gospel. Let's go to, look, to Acts chapter 6, verse 12 to 15. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testify. This fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place, change the custom Moses handed down to us. These are the accusations. They have to bring false witnesses to say this. Verse 15, and all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin look intently at Stephen. And, this, and they saw that his face was, was like the face of an angel. So I used to think that God didn't intervene because he didn't deliver him. But when I read this, I see that God was present with him. God was with him. And, and that's the reality that we are never alone. God is always with us. And then Stephen goes into the largest, the longest sermon that we find in the book of Acts. We're not going to read it today because we will probably not finish on time. But this is a powerful sermon. And in this sermon, he talks about some important people in the Old Testament. Number one, he talks about Abraham. God called Abraham even before he was in the promised land. In fact, Stephen says he not even received his inheritance. He not even owned a piece of land. But that didn't 
stop him from having a relationship with God. Remember the accusation against Stephen is he is speaking against the temple. Because for them, the temple has become an idol. So Stephen talks about Abraham. God made a covenant with him even before he possessed the promised land. Then he talks about Joseph, another character of the Old Testament, who is a type or or represents the work of Christ. And we have a lot of similarities between Joseph and Christ that I'm sure that a lot of you have seen how Joseph was betrayed by his brothers. He was betrayed by 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was betrayed by 30 pieces of silver. I guess the price of a slave have gone up in the time of Jesus. But he was betrayed by his brothers. But because Joseph understood that, that God's plan for his life was bigger than what his brothers had done to him, he brought salvation to them. He delivered them. In the same way, God, Jesus Christ was betrayed by his brothers, but his purpose was to bring salvation to all humanity. So in a way, Joseph is a type of Christ rejected by his brothers. So Stephen is telling them, you know, your ancestor, the patriarchs, rejected Joseph. So maybe also you're committing the same mistake. Then he talks about Moses. Moses also was rejected by his people. Also a type of Christ. And in Exodus 3, 5, we have this experience that Moses had. God meets with him there. You know the story of the burning bush, and God tells him, remove the sandals from your feet, because the place where you're standing is holy ground. Stephen is telling them, you know, you worship the temple, but God can meet with you not only in the temple. God is not confined to, to a place only, but he's everywhere. And you know, that's wonderful news for us. Because some of us are now here in this temple, but we've been worshiping at home for so many days, and I know that um, some of our church members are also at home. But the reality is that they can also, wherever they are, they can have that experience with God. Because God is everywhere, and we need to learn that, that, that we can worship him anywhere we are. In fact, Jesus tells us when he speaks to the Samaritan woman that he is looking for those worshipers that worship him him in spirit and in truth. So God is not confined to a place. But Moses also tells a prophecy in Deuteronomy 18, 15. Moses tells him, a prophet like me God will raise up for you among your brothers. So if you read the Old Testament, you're going to find that there is an expectation of of, of that prophet. And and, and the Old Testament ends with, and there was some of the last parts of the Bible of the Old Testament are Deuteronomy. And in that part, The Bible says that there was no prophet like Moses that spoke with God face to face. So there is that expectation that there's going to be another prophet that is going to come. So what Stephen is doing, that he's showing God acts in history, keeping his covenant with his people, not because they deserve it, not because they are good, but because God is faithful. But there is something else that that Stephen tells them. And he tells them that when they rejected Moses as leader, they they worship idols. And this is something that, that we need to remember, that when we reject truth, error comes, and we are deceived by that. And that is exactly what happened. When they rejected Moses as leader, they they went and worshiped the golden calf. So the same thing Stephen is telling him is happening to you. You rejected Jesus, and now you're worshiping the temple. 
they, they don't like that. So he tells them that, that God has been with them, even though they have been rebellious. And then he quotes from Isaiah 66. And he tells them, Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is my place of rest? Did not my hand make all these things? So he's telling them that God is everywhere, not just in that temple. But then he says something amazing. He tells them, you kill the righteous one. And if, if you read these chapters 6 and 7 of Acts, but then you go to the Old Testament, you're going to see there is a lot of references in the, to the Old Testament. Uh, uh, Stephen is, is quoting from Isaiah. He's quoting from Exodus. But here he's quoting from, from Isaiah 53, the righteous one, the righteous servant. So they make that connection. It is fascinating that I have heard testimonies of many Jewish people that when they read the chapter 53 of Isaiah, that's when they understand about Jesus. So Stephen is quoting from Isaiah. He said, you kill the righteous one, and then the connection with Isaiah 53, 11 says, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. So he's making that connection that the one that they were waiting for, the prophet that God was going to raise, the, uh, the righteous servant, it was none other than Jesus Christ. Today, before, before I came here to church, I was listening to uh, Handel's Messiah. It's one of my favorite <laughs> pieces of music. Because it talks about, about this servant. It talks about Jesus being rejected. It talks about the work of God. And I was thinking, what a wonderful experience Stephen had. Even though it seems that God didn't intervene in his life. But he experienced the joy. He rejoiced because he understood that Jesus had told them that they needed to rejoice when they were persecuted because they were doing the will of God. They didn't like that. And he tells them, you, you see God working throughout history. You see, God gave you the law, but you did not keep it. And then he goes, chapter 57, chapter 7, 57 to 60. I don't know if you've ever been like this, but when people cover their ears, things are not going well for you. At this, when they hear, they cover their ears and yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Okay, this is something that we need to understand here. They didn't have the authority to do this. The, the Sanhedrin didn't have the authority to kill anyone. They would have to go to the Romans the, the same way they did with Christ. That's why they went to Pilate to ask permission. But they are so enraged that they take things in their own hands. They cover their ears yelling at the top of their voices because they don't want to hear more at hand. So they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. I don't know if you have thought about what they did to Stephen here, but these were large stones that they will start dropping on these people. They would expect that the first or the second one would kill the person. But it, it, it never happened like that. So we don't know how many. And the law says that, uh, that the first witnesses were the ones who were supposed to throw the first stones. But when we read the story, we know that this was false witnesses. 
but they still go and they throw the first stones at Stephen, drag him out of the city and begin to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses lay their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, okay, false witnesses, false charges, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And we ha when he had said this, he fell asleep. He died. It is important for us to understand false witnesses kill a man of God. Where is God? Where is God? And I think most of us always ask the question when we're going through something that we don't understand. I don't know if I shared this with you before, but uh, when I was 12 years old, I spent like two and a half months at the hospital. And you know at that age, 12 years old, you wanna be running and playing and doing all the kind of stuff. And I was at the hospital for all that time. And I, I wasn't happy about it. But remember that I told you that, uh, that my parents got me that Bible? When I was 12 is when I read the Bible many times. And, but you know what's, what's the wonderful thing about it? That even now that I am 46, Sometimes I go into things in life, and those verses that I read when I was 12 come back to my mind. So what I want to tell you this morning is that maybe you're going through situations in your life, and especially with what we're seeing with this pandemic, either we know someone who is going through something, and always the question is, where is God in all of this? But the re reality is that God is there, present. And even though he seems that he's not intervening, he is there. His presence is with us always. And that's the advantage that we have, that when we spend time in his word, we'll go through trials and difficult moments in our lives, but we will have the assurance that we are not alone, that Jesus is with us. So I wanna encourage you this morning to keep honoring God in whatever you do. You see, when we read in chapter two in the book of Acts, we read all this powerful sermon that, that, that prayer preaches there, and people will cut to the heart, and they accept to Jesus. When we read the story of Stephen, they were also cut to the heart, but they reacted different. So not everyone reacts the same to the gospel, but I wanna encourage you to keep honoring God wherever you are, wherever you're doing, that you keep honoring him. You know, when, uh, when I grew up in El Salvador, my, my parents, they became Adventists. Um, but my, my grandparents also became Adventists. So there, there were these men, Beto Velasquez, Alberto Velasquez. He was the only Adventist in the whole community. He never shared anything with anyone. They just saw him that every Sabbath, he would get ready and go to the city because there was no church in the town, so he would go to the city for church. They didn't know, they just saw that he didn't work on Sabbath, got ready, Sabbath morning, went to church, never shared anything with anyone. Well, hey, we should do more than just getting ready for church. But, uh, um, but then an evangelist came, and because he knew many people from the community, he invited these people to the meetings, and, uh, and my parents came, 
my grandparents came, and all of them became Seventh-day Adventists. Because someone was doing the minimum. He was honoring God. He was doing the minimum, and that sends a message to everyone. So many may turn against you, you know, if you share with them about Jesus. Uh, people will tend to make fun of you or do any other thing. But remember that even Stephen's death, death had a profound impact on Paul, who later became the greatest missionary. So even those who oppose you now, there is hope because they can turn to Christ. And those are the good news. That God has placed us in different, different communities with different circle of friends, neighbors, so that we can, like, as Stephen did, be witness about Jesus. Because when we do that, we will, we will feel God's presence closer and closer to us. It's, this has a powerful impact on Paul that he later remembered how he was part of that and how Stephen testified about God's love. It was, it was an easy way for him to get out of that situation. You see, but he chose to honor God. And when you choose to honor God, yeah, sometimes things are going to be difficult at first. But I hear in the Bible that all those who have suffered for Christ will receive a crown of glory when Jesus returns. So we have our work to do as church in this place to share about the love of Jesus with others. Would you like to do that? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you because of Jesus. We thank you because he has done everything for us. We thank you because faithful people like Stephen who shared their blood, Lord, but because of them, the testimony of Jesus continued to spread. And many people knew about God because of him. So help us, Lord, to keep honoring you, to witness for you wherever we are, to share about the love of Jesus with others, and Father, help us to, to stay faithful until the end. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching our program today. If you have any questions, please call us at 781-438-2977. Again, that is 781-438-2977. We hope to see you soon in person here at our church on Saturdays for our 1045 a.m. worship service or for Monday night prayer time at 7 p.m. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.